First of all, I want to welcome everyone uh, to our first lecture here at our Lady Help of Christians Men's Group, Chivalry for Christ. My name is Kurt Moher. And I'd like to acknowledge all everyone that came and took their valuable t uh, time tonight, uh, this beautiful Saturday evening, to learn about a subject matter that we feel is so important, so definitively apropos, a topic whose codes, if mastered by Christian men, have the power, historically, and has proven to send the enemies of our Savior and Church running. It's interesting to note that when chivalry was at its height in society in medieval Europe, so was the Church's influence on the then rulers of the world. And the church's, as the Church's influence waned, so unfortunately were the virtues associated with chivalry, such as honor, integrity, and discipline. Part of the reason for coming out this evening is to learn how to better serve our Lord Christ the King in our personal lives. Mark, for there is no more dangerous a foe than a fully armed Christian man who is educated in the art of war, trained in how and learned to strike with his weapons, and motivated by his faith. Dear Crystal Wright. All right. Think of the spirit behind the First Crusade, the dedication of Godfrey of Jerusalem, the attraction of Joan of Arc, the sheer force of Charlemagne. These men and women dedicated their lives to our Lord and Church. Indeed, our brave forefathers saved Western civilization on several occasions. The Battle of La Punta, the Battle of Vienna, and various other battles, including Malta, to name just a few. Indeed, we have here this very night, a knight from that order, Dr. Edgar. Give it up for Dr. Edgar. Knight of Malta. Monsignor also. Give it up for Monsignor. The knights still live. More men like these, girded with the truth, are what we need today. Thousands of men storming heaven on one side with their prayers and projecting the will of God on earth on the other. In other words, a renewed, rearmed, mobilized church militant. Are you gentlemen ready to be mobilized? Yes. yes. Viva Crystal Ray! Viva! I want to hear your best battle cry. Let's Viva Crystal Ray! Okay, that was only one person. One, two, three. It's all. Viva Crystal Ray! Hey, Viva! Now, you have to go next a little bit, guys, as I paint for you uh, the battle that we're in. And indulge me for a few moments. Here we are in the 21st century. We live in a modern matrix of collectivism. It is important to acknowledge that there is an outright war going on between good and evil, and we're right in the thick of it. Although this battle is not new, the enemy is more scientifically engineered, systemic, cold, calculated, orchestrated than ever before, especially with their use of modern technologies. All means are used by the enemy to destroy civilization including government control, propaganda, television, music, academia, and the internet. Chivalry is a great hedge against the current culture of death affecting our society. Yes, there is a war, and we are currently the target, target of Agenda 21 and the depopulation czars of the world. Their goal, according to their own white papers and Georgia Guidestones, is to reduce the world's population to 400 million people. Obviously, that implies that five billion of us have to die. But their methods are not all hard kills. They subtly infuse a kind of spirit into the world that actually causes the masses to self-destruct. I'll give you proof and points. Protestants accepting birth control have unwittingly approved their own demise by not reproducing themselves. Unfortunately, many cafeteria Catholics do the same. Western Europe, Japan, and the United States are dying in negative growth curves. Like the pagan Aztec sun worshippers offering human sacrifices to their diablos, abortion death mills in the United States take 4,000 baby lives a day. Suicide is on the rise, especially within the ranks of the military. If that's not enough, euthanasia is being pawned into the collective consciousness as a merciful way to avoid suffering. In summary, this philosophy dictates that suffering is considered an unnecessary inconvenience 
therefore, why not just kill everyone that's suffering? Now, my father-in-law is from the Netherlands, and we just lost a family friend there who was diagnosed with cancer. He took the Kool-Aid from this philosophy, made the arrangements, and killed himself. Now he knows better. <laughs> Imagine um, preparing the handwritten invitations to your own funeral. This is going on every day. Uh, we have more children and adults on psychotropic drugs than ever before dimming their senses and their ability to think cognitively, kind of mental death. Poisonous chem travels cloud our skies, fluorinated water runs through our taps, and despite the people's will, GMO products are snuck into our food systems. The result of this is a doped up, drunk, brainwashed, and musically impaired generation of Americans that celebrate pop culture with Madonna masturbating on stage. Divorce is approaching 60%, and don't get me going on Proposition 8. Twelve states have made it legal for homosexuals to marry. Another slap in our heart's face, including the District of Columbia. Indeed, our nation has separated itself from God. No prayers allowed in public school, no nativity scenes in the town square, no more crosses in city property. All vestiges of our Lord and Savior, Christ the King, are quickly and clinically being exterminated. Churches are compromising with the government in an attempt to maintain their tax-free status, while the perceived enemies of the state are audited by the unconstitutional collection apparatus known as the IRS. Meanwhile, the Department of Defense has labeled fundamental Christians and traditional Catholics as potential terrorist threats. Look at the terrorists around you. Viva Cristo Rey. All of this... Right there while unpracticing Catholic politicians sit down and dine with the highest prelates of our country and our church, garnishing votes while publicly and scandalously consuming our Lord and Holy Communion. Meanwhile, the citizens of this once great country are forced into a kind of indentured financial serfdom. The truth is we pay between 40 and 60 percent in taxes. In medieval times we paid no more than 10 percent under a Catholic regime. The ironic thing is that the people in the United States think that they're free. Because they're told that they're free, that this is the land of the free. With every form of communication being monitored, dissected, categorized, subcategorized, we the citizenry are being subjugated to a lesser class than our governors. Aldous Huxley and George Orwell shared such a vision. Indeed, we have incarcerated more people per capita in the United States than the entire world. If you, you are actually considered a threat if you visited the wrong website, joined the wrong political party, visited the wrong church, or attended uh, the wrong group. You could be placed on a terrorist watch list, thus making it almost impossible to travel. There's about two million people on that watch list right now, the last I checked. And speaking of flying, I don't remember the Nazi Gestapo's ever doing cavity searches on people at their train stations like the Department of Homeland Security does. Another way to fondle and degrade the public. It's all conditioning, gentlemen. Now when our Lord said the gates of hell shall not prevail, we certainly know now from history that he was warning us that our lives here on earth would not be easy. In fact, if we read in the word prevail, one can easily deduce in the duality nature of good versus evil that the powers of heaven through the mysterious will of God may forfeit control of the world temporarily, that the good Lord in His infinite wisdom would allow mankind to suffer under the yoke of His own self-righteous pride, and that the forces of hell and the demonic minions would have a temporary rule of the roost. All of this suffering because man chooses not to serve Christ the King. In the secular sense, the enemy has all the money in the world through their self-serving fiat currency and fractional reserve banking system, they can print out as much money as they need to pay off or bribe almost anyone. And although their power is immense, they certainly are not undefeatable. Remember, gentlemen, there's no peace in the devil's camp. So let this meeting tonight be a personal Catholic call to arms. Let us challenge ourselves with the current tasks at hand. What the enemy does not control is your own free will. 
Now, Admiral Nelson had a famous saying. He said, um, England expects every man to do his duty. And that would be at the Battle of Trafalgar, 1804, one in the Napoleonic Battle. But that is another example of the deification of state. So tonight, I'd like to reverse that a little bit. I, I would say that your duty, gentlemen, Christ the King expects every man to do his duty. What do you think of that? For you are men, and you can manfully fight the Mundus, the Cardo, and the Diablos, the world, the flesh, and the devil, by practicing these wonderful codes of chivalry that our forefathers have given us. Now at this moment, I would like the young men to stand. Anyone in their 20s or teens or even below that, please young men, stand up. Okay. Young knights, the enemy has declared war on your king, your country, your family, and your church. Please make mental notes this evening when you, along with your fathers and brothers, contemplated how best to quickly dispatch this enemy. Sharpen your spiritual swords, for when the generation before thee has passed, you will be given the reins of the future fight. You will take the battle on with your for after your forefathers and ancestors, and if, it, if you will it, you will be victorious. Let's give it up for these young men. We're a toast. We're going to do a toast. Folks. If you don't have anything, just borrow from the guy next to you. It's empty, but I'll toast it. All right. First of all, I'd like to make a toast to our Lord and Savior. Uh, our Creator, who knew us before we were born, who set the world in order, who gave us a great opportunity to shine in these hard times. Christ the King. Christ the King. Christ the King. Christ the King. Now, you can't toast a king without toasting his queen. So I'd like to toast to Our Lady, help of Christians, our Blessed Mother. Blessed Mother. And one more. I'd like to toast to all the gentlemen here tonight, and all of our ancestors, and all the knights who fell on the battlefield for our Lord, who, who may have died unwept in some ditch in Jerusalem, someplace, that gave their lives to the Lord, to all the holy orders of knights. Holy orders of knights. Please see, gentlemen. Now, I'm very proud to introduce you tonight a person that I can actually say is a very old and a very good friend. We met back in the early 90s when there were only a couple of Latin Indo masses allowed in the entire Archdiocese of Los Angeles under the now infamous Cardinal Mahoney. Specifically, I met Charles Cologne at the San Fernando Mission at the 12 o'clock Sunday High Mass, celebrated there by who was then the archivist of the Archdiocese, Monsignor Weber. Oh, yeah. We went despite the sometimes condescending attitude of the Archdiocese towards the poor participants of that Mass, probably because we were the summation of every rag-tag element of the pre-council church. I mean, that the Archdiocese wanted to forget. We weren't supposed to be around still. There were Sede Vacantis, Opus Dei members, SSPX spies, <laughs> Franciscan third orders. There was every devotee for every unsashed Marian apparition. <laughs> there were church conspiracy theorists. There were the arch traditionalists and even a few Anglican crossovers. And along with the typical UFO abductees. <laughs> Anyway, it was there with this, that kind of mixed bag of Catholic orthodoxy that I found myself, viewed under the often cynical eye of Monsignor Weber, who we got the impression didn't take us that seriously. Um, I find myself looking forward to his homilies only because they were often interrupted by the most shrill cries of the old mission's peacock population. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard a peacock shrill? It's like. <laughs> 
I guess. There, I found myself enjoying the mercy of the Lord in the Mass, and I also got to observe His justice up front. <laughs> when I met Charles there, I was impressed with his knowledge of European history and church history. His photographic memory is tapped many times, especially when conjuring up lost and forgotten Catholic and Scottish Irish fight songs sung at Sunday champagne brunch after Mass. They really loved us at that restaurant, but not really. <laughs> we paid, we loved it. When it came to bringing our first speaker on the subject of chivalry, Charles was our go-to man. Yes, he has taught at Oxford. Yes, he's been consulted and interviewed by major media in regard to the conflicts of the church. He's a monarchist, a poet, an author, who earlier this year finished his first electronic book, The Legacy of Benedict XVI. He is a member of more than the 100-year-old Catholic Newman Club in Los Angeles, he can be found on any given second Friday, like he was last night, teaching on his famous fireside chats, the Teresita and Duarte. Is that the Teresita and Duarte? Teresita and Duarte. Teresita and Duarte. La Hambra. La sorry. La Hambra. Some interesting factoids about Charles that you may not know. He is a French-Canadian by birth. He graduated from the New Mexico Military Institute and later joined the Marine Corps as an officer and gentleman. His parents were both stage actors, ergo his stage presence. For a spell, he was a stand-up comedian in Hollywood, an original member of the Ritz-Carlton Martini Club, <laughs> and co-founder of the P.J. Woodhouse-esque Drones Club, always the life of the party. Uh, but not to give the wrong impression, there is no one I know that is more serious, more dedicated when it comes to the defense of the Holy Roman Catholic Church Let's give a big round of applause for Charles. Seriously, gentlemen, reverend fathers and gentlemen, uh, it is always kind of a challenge to address an after-dinner crowd because I'm competing with your digestion for attention. Uh, in New York, you know, unfortunately, what they will tend to do is overstack after-dinner speakers. I mean, I've been at banquets with two, three, four after-dinner speakers. I was hired to speak at one. It was pretty terrible because uh, they had seven before me. Oh. And every time someone would get up to speak, more people would leave. <laughs> and finally, there was one individual left on the audience, and those of us on the days. And the rest of them, you know what, they paid me to come out here, they paid my fee, they're going to get that talk, I don't care. <laughs> I stood up, I gave my talk, the fellow sat there, when I finished, I said, Sir, I really want to thank you for sitting through all that. And he looks at me and he says, didn't have a choice, did I? I'm the next speaker. <laughs> than that this evening. Because the truth, what we do have to speak about is rather serious. Chivalry. Now, you heard the phrase, when knighthood was in flower. Yes? The days and the nights. How many here saw the sword of the stone? Remember? The old king had died. Yes? A wonderful line, uh, a legend is sung of when England was young. And knights were brave and bold. We all have this picture in our heads of what knights are. Of course, the code of the knight was chivalry. And the chivalry that we're speaking of tonight. Before we can talk about it, we have to define it. Before we can define chivalry, we have to define the knight. And before we define the knight, we have to define what it was, which is a sort of soldier. Before we can define what the soldier is, we have to define what a man is. This is a very important thing, especially for you younger gentlemen, because manhood is not something we like to talk about these days. For one thing, it's sexist. If you have a gender of your own that isn't female, well, you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important to bear in mind that the 
masculine is much more than being biologically male. The old spiritual writers always referred to the soul as she, because God is supremely masculine. That is why the church is his spouse, <coughs> you see. It's very important to get that right. Now, Christ himself, believe it or not, was a man. And was very masculine. He had three roles, which in a sense is bestowed upon every human man. And what were those three roles? They were king, priest, and father. Now, we differentiate those three roles, of course, in human society. There are kings, there are priests, there are fathers. But notice something important. Every one of those three partakes to some degree of the other two. Now, we don't have kings anymore. We have Obama, which is <laughs> uh, a great replacement. Never, but never. let's set him aside just for the moment, maybe all night, and think for a second what kingship is. Bear in mind that the pattern, the archetype, is Christ the King, whose statue you have, of course, in the sanctuary. In case anyone's wondering, you notice he has that gold wand and the globe. Well, it's not really a wand, it's a scepter. And the globe is a globe. If you ever see the crown jewels with which, very varying sorts, with which most of the European Christian monarchs were crowned, you'll notice that while they're all very different, they have certain basic elements in common. A crown on the head, a scepter, and an orb. And the orb always has the cross on top of it to show that Christ rules the world. Uh, the American crown jewels were lost with the Titanic version. <laughs> but that's why you haven't heard about them. But uh, human kingship should partake of fatherhood and priesthood. How does it partake of fatherhood? Well, because the king is supposed to be father to his people. If you uh, remember your Shakespeare, and Henry V agonizing over sending his men into battle at Agincourt. That is the agony of a father sending his sons to do something they must do, but he's not really very keen on it. A little bit like your own dad sending you off to your first day at school. Only a lot worse because you probably didn't get killed there unless you went to Blessed Sacrament like I did. Anyway, no, 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 no. But seriously, uh, that should characterize a ruler is a sense of fatherhood toward his subjects. Now, the priesthood of the king, that's an odd thing. But traditionally, Catholic monarchs were anointed, which was a sacramental. It's often called an eighth sacrament. Uh, the, they were very often given quasi ecclesiastical roles. The Holy Roman Emperor was a canon of St. Peter's, the King of France was a canon of St. John Lateran, the King of England before the Defamation was a canon of St. Paul outside the walls. And the king of Spain is to this day a canon of St. Mary Major. And mind you, in their own countries, they had all sorts of particular relationships with parishes and abbeys and all that. But that wasn't all. Uh, there were major feast days that they were expected to play a part in. The king marched with the Blessed Sacrament in Corpus Christi. He washed the feet of the poor on Martin Thursday. He presented gold, frankincense, and myrrh at some altar chapel, at some chapel altar on the epiphany. And so it went. He was supposed to present to his people, he was supposed to basically be their leader in prayer, the first layman of the realm. And when he was crowned, he wore a dalmatic and a stole. The funny thing is that certain of the major kings of Europe also had liturgical roles when they were grown. If they happened to be visiting, they would attend the Pope's Mass as deacon or subdeacon. That's the priestly role of the king. All right, now let's move down to the priest. Uh, say it references, as the old Irish woman was wont to say it. Uh, the priest partakes of both father and king. I'm not going to tell you how they partake of fatherhood, but there's a reason why we call them father. If you don't know, I can't explain. <laughs> the kingship bit is actually most obvious in the confession. You might argue with a priest 
on this or that bit of policy outside the confessional. But in the confessional, he is sovereign because he speaks for God. Mind you, if you go to some of the priests I've known and try to argue him out of, argue him out of what you had done being sinful, but that's another story. <laughs> Seriously, when he gives you penances and things like that, you have to take them as though for the king's order. And he does have a certain jurisdiction over his church, <coughs> over the sacraments he dispenses. Uh, as with any other human, he might do it well or badly, but he has that right in any case. And then lastly, there's the father. The father partakes of both kingship and priesthood. How so? Well, and I hope there are no wives here, because I don't want to see any of you sent home with scalps. <laughs> but the man is supposed to wear the pants of the family. No. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind saying this. Today is my father's feast day, St. Peter's day. My father's called Guy, which somehow turns into Vitos or Vito. I don't know how that works, but it does. So if uh, you get anything on me this evening, remember of your charity, the soul of God, the woman in prayer, the greatest man I ever knew. And I can say that without hesitation. Every son ought to be able to say that about his father just as you ought to be able to look up to your king. The father, although the mother, God knows, has a very important role, and is often the one who carries out day-to-day -day running in the home, it is the father who should set policy. It is the father who should set the tone. Why are my brother and I practicing Catholics? Because our father was. And because he made it clear to us that his religion was more important to him than anything else. And we admired him more than any other man we knew. And that gentleman is how you keep your sons in the faith. That's a very important thing to bear in mind. And for those of you young men who are contemplating marriage, you remember that. It's very, very important. Your role as father is the biggest that wants the biggest cross and the biggest joy you'll ever have, and it's certainly the biggest obligation. And you can consider nothing in your life without that. We're right here at the foundations, and don't think this has nothing to do with chivalry. Because in this case, chivalry very, very much begins at home. If you were chivalrous, gentlemen, the sons would be chivalrous. Now, the other one is priest. How is the father of the priest. Because he gives out communion, like in the Mormon church. No! No, that's not true. The Mormons do that, by the way. Every father really is a priest. But, no, uh, he is a priest because he is the leader of the home devotions. The one who ensures that you get, your kids get to Mass and that they're instructed properly. My uh, brother and I grew up during the wonderful 60s and 70s. We went to Catholic schools. Learned so much. <laughs> you be Jesus was nice. You be nice too. <laughs> but our father went through our books very carefully. He never thought something was wrong. He said so. But he would tell his wife that it was wrong. Also, he never expected to take us take it on faith. So those are the three most masculine roles: king, priest, and father. And they all reflect different aspects of our Lord Himself. Now, there you have the male. Now I'm going to tell you another deep, dark secret. And I'm very sorry for anyone who I'm hurting by telling you this. Gentlemen, in this world there is conflict. <coughs> yes, it is true. There is conflict. Sometimes people don't agree. Sometimes they steal. Sometimes they take things. So they're awful. And because of this, there is sometimes things called disputes. Now when these disputes cease to be peaceful, you come to what are called blows. How many here ever fought a fight on the uh, playground, in the school ground? None of the young ones, because you went to, you know, all, those other, none of, all the homeschoolers, of course, didn't get to fight something. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure that's 
through. Yeah, I got a real knocked out drag out my ma. You wouldn't believe it. Okay. That's great. Anyway, well, I assure you that fights of that sort were a common feature of school ground life. Why? Because man has fallen. And even if you have the best intentions, you're not perfect, and you will come into conflict with other people, and sometimes those conflicts come to blows. As a result, what was the job of the king, the priest, and the father? All three? To safeguard those under them. And as society grew, and more and more people eventually had things called armies. These armies were made up of soldiers. And one of the earliest things we know, as far back as our tales and legends and chronicles go, is that people fight wars. There were all sorts of things. But, parenthetically, there's one thing I want to tell you, which you can feel free to carry on the next time you hear this. Anybody ever hear, I don't have that religion. Think of all the people who died in the name of religion. Every day. Ever, ever heard that anyone? <laughs> okay, uh, let me let you in on a scoop. Starting with the American Revolution, billions more have died in the name of freedom than for any religion. So, as a result, whenever someone says that to me, I say, you know, you're so right, but so many more have died for freedom. I guess freedom's evil, too. <laughs> no, they don't want to keep talking about it. I don't know why. Anyway, where are we going with this? Because... Fighting for all the fact that it's terrible, and it's awful, and it's painful, and it makes you late for dinner, and it can be uncomfortable, and you're made to eat sea rations if you're living in World War II. Um, for all that, it does bring out certain qualities of the individual, good and bad, that would not come out otherwise. Dr. Samuel Johnson, of whom some of you may have heard, had a very interesting comment, which was, depend upon it, when he managed to be hung in the morning, focuses his mind wonderfully. <laughs> well, the same is actually true of combat. When you know that you may not see sundown, sometimes you manage to gather your thoughts a little bit. And that can be a very, very wonderful thing. Or it can be terrible. It can be the breaking of it. That's the sad thing about life. Unfortunately, gentlemen, we <clears throat> tend to <clears throat> rise or fall, stand or fail, depending upon what we've already got in us. Which is why we always have to pray a lot. Because the truth of it is, none of us by ourselves are capable of withstanding much. I digress. From the very, very early times, what did people, in all cultures that we know of, what did they revere? The hero. The hero. And what made a hero? Someone who was willing to sacrifice himself for his friends, for his neighbors, for his people, for his king. Someone who had a great deal of prowess in what he did, was a great fighter. And someone who stood up as a warrior to the plate. He did not back away, did not back down. <clears throat> now these came to be seen as virtues, but they are natural virtues. That is to say, um, yeah. Whether you're talking about Alexander the Great or Chester Port, you are talking about a natural man fighting in combat that is essentially human. All right, now then, we're getting all perilously close to knighthood. Now, you all here have heard of the Roman Empire? Yeah, a few of us. <clears throat> The homeschoolers heard of it. All right, great. Uh, those who went to Catholic and public school probably wouldn't know. But the Roman Empire, as we all know, fell. Now, it was to some great degree Catholicized before it fell. And then it came the Germanic times. And these were interesting people with names like Visigoths, Ostrogoths, my personal favorite, the Vandals. Uh, they say they're extinct, but you wouldn't believe it from my old neighborhood, but never mind. Uh, and, of course, most importantly, the Franks. <coughs> now, these were savage people. They were not nice at all when they came into the sphere of civilization. In fact, they were, they were cruel. The women were worse. You know, that's one of the things you find. It was true of the American Indians. 
It was true to the Germanic barbarians, it's true to the Near East, that to women fell torture. And there's a Kipling poem uh, coming from the Afghanistan war that the British fought as successfully as anyone else ever has. And it has the line in it, when wounded out on Afghanistan's plains, and the women come out to cut up what remains, roll over your gun and blow out your brains, and go to your God like a soldier. That is not Christian. That is Viking. That is Germanic. But it does tell you something about not wanting to fall in the hands of the Afghan ladies. It tells me about this. So, the thing is then that the church in every age has always had a problem. And the problem is that she lives in a fallen world amongst fallen men. And she has to deal with that. And she can't deal with them as though they were angels. I know what you're thinking. What about me? <laughs> yeah, well, that's why there's a confession to keep you angelic. Uh, and so, every age of the church offers the church a new challenge, a new problem. So, the Roman civilization falls almost, if not quite, of its own weight. And then in come these savage tribes. When I say savage, I mean savage. And they have energy. They can do extraordinary things. They went berserk. And I don't mean like your boss finding out you haven't done what you promised you to do. No. I mean really berserk. What to do with these people? Well, I'll tell you what they did. Slowly but surely, over time, as generations generation of these barbaric peoples became more and more Catholic and more and more civilized. That, that energy, that fire was channeled. In one area, it went to the great monasteries of Europe. You know, you look at these monks doing these things, you see the saints standing in water reciting the entire the psalm, the entire of the psalm, the psalms overnight, standing in cold water. I mean, that, there's something of the, of the barbaric energy of the tribesmen in that. There's a famous story, uh, and you're Irish. <laughs> a few people are willing to admit it. Okay, nice. Uh, no one's all right. Nothing against the Irish in their place. Anyway, <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's okay, you know. Chauffeurs, gardeners, that kind of. Anyway, uh, you may know the story when St. Patrick, who was French, of course, uh, came out. <laughs> he. Uh, Amongst other places and peoples and things, he baptized Cormac, the king of Cashel, on the rock of Cashel. <coughs> well, he had a petrol cross, and as he was going through the ceremony, he stuck it in the ground. What he didn't realize was that he'd stuck it through Cormac's foot. <laughs> <laughs> so he finishes baptizing, pulls it up, looks, oh my gosh, and he said, this is a true story, not a joke. Why didn't you tell me about this? What? what? He said, well, I thought it was part of the ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> because, a true story, because they were used to that kind of initiation right. Primitive peoples buy their manhood dearly. And King Cormac saw baptism as the equivalent. I mean, obviously, theologically, you know what it was, but that was how he, shall we say, well, thought of it. And if you read, uh, read the writings of people at that time, there's a Germanic book, I think it's in English, Helot, that portrays our Lord as a sort of Viking warrior prince. I mean, it, it's, it's very different from the Gospels, but you can see why the uh, Northern Germans and the Scandinavians were impressed by it. The Apostles is a sort of war band that were with him and so on. And there's actually a sense in which that's true. Not that our Lord did uh, physical battle against other chiefs, but he certainly did battle against the devil. That one. And an important thing to bear in mind, when we say that certain things are symbolic of Christ and this and that, in a way it's misleading. Because it implies that we're the real thing and Christ is sort of the image of us. No, 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 no. Christ is the reality and we in our poor way trying to reflect it. So, for instance, when Pius XI wrote of the kingship of Christ in Cross Primas, 
He's, he pointed out that Christ is king of us all, king of this whole world, king of every nation, for three reasons. One, by right of inheritance. Because he was the rightful son, rightful heir of David, king in Jerusalem. Two, which were actually should have gone first, by right of creation. Because he was the God that made this world. <coughs> three, by right of conquest. And what was that conquest? The death on the cross. We read plus three months. The right of conquest. Now, eventually, eventually, out of the merger of Catholicism and this Germanic energy, emerged knighthood. At what time were we, talk, were we speaking about? Well, immediately post Carolingian, when Charlemagne's empire began to fragment. That was when they had more need, not just because of the material fragmentation in Europe, but because the Norse were attacking, the Muslims were attacking. Uh, Western Christendom was not in a good way. Eastern Christendom wasn't doing so hot either. And they, they needed soldiers, strong men at arms like them before. Now in those early times, knighthood was rather different to what it would become. Early on, three kinds of people could make knights. They were kings, bishops, and other knights. As time went on, that would become more and more restricted. Eventually it became just kings and bishops. Now, moving along, because I, I could go on and on about this era, which I'm fascinated with, knighthood as we think of it was crystallized by the Crusades. And earlier, Kirk mentioned Godfrey, Godfrey de Bouillon, who was the leader of the First Crusade. He led his men all the way from the west of Europe to Constantinople, and then through Asia Minor, the horrible siege of Antioch, down to Jerusalem. And finally, they liberated the Holy Sepulchre of our Lord. And his men asked him to be king. And he refused. He said, I will not wear a crown of gold, or our Savior wore a crown of thorns. That is an aspect chivalric nature, if we will. From the Crusades arose the great religious orders of whom we spoke earlier. The Order of Malta, the Holy Sepulchre, the Temples, the Teutonic Knights, the Order of St. Lazarus. They were particularly interesting because their members were all lepers in the beginning. And nothing was apparently more frightening for the Saracens than being charged by a bunch of lepers. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even need swords, which is good, because sometimes the sword would come off the arm, you know. They feared them only so, did pigs? <laughs> they feared them more than they did pigs? It, what's that? They feared them more than they did pigs? Oh, gosh, much more. You didn't want leprosy. Trust me, you'd rather, if given a choice between hanging out with a leper and eating a pig, Porky would be dead. So, the end result of all this good stuff is that these orders were established and in various forms have come down to our own day. By this time, the codes of chivalry began to be established. So we support bear in mind too, although today we think primarily of knighthood in terms of those orders. Uh, in those days, it wasn't the case. There were lots of knights who were not members of any order. However, something else happened, which I should mention for the sake of completeness. Uh, so impressed by these great religious orders of knights were the kings of Europe that they began to gather their palace around them and form orders of knights of their own, some of which have survived to this day. The Garter in England, the Golden Fleece in uh, Burgundy in Austria and Spain, uh, Saint Michel in France, uh, and a number of others. And a lot of these have continued to the present day, although most of them have become mere decorations for merit. So, the whole idea of knighthood that we think of is really a product of that period. That was when the great Arthurian legends were written, although their subject matter predates them by quite some time, but it was reworked. King Arthur and Camelot probably did not look a lot like 12th century Winchester. Probably not. But nevertheless, 
that there was such a person in such a place is hard to deny, given our current knowledge of archaeology and so forth. There were, and you keep seeing writers about Nitro and Nasera, there were three, we're referring back to it, there were three cycles of literature about Nitro. It was called the Matter of Rome, that dealt with, strangely enough, Alexander, Julius Caesar, who were kind of recast as chivalric figures. It was the Matter of Britain, which dealt with King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table and all that we grew up with. And then there was the most important of all, the Matter of France. I said the Matter of France. Yes. Uh, which dealt with Charlemagne, and my patron. And, uh, <laughs> and his 12 paladins. <laughs> so, whenever you read the contemporary writings of knights about the profession, about chivalry, they're constantly referring back to these three groups and the characters. And, you know, you want to be a knight like Roland, you want to be like Galahad, and so on and so forth. So you want to understand the self-image, if you will. It's good to know that kind of literature. Now, we get to the meat of the issue, what then was chivalry? What was the code that they followed? Well, I've got some pertinent quotes, which I don't mind reading in a little bit of length, because they're worth knowing, and because the authors who wrote them are worth your while. Due to the wonders of the internet, you can read just about all of this stuff. So if you've got pen and paper, or even if you don't, jot down the names. Uh, they won't mind if you write them on the table. <laughs> Let's see if people are already starting to write them on the table. Okay, great. Uh, so, there was a gentleman called Ken Allen Digby. Can you spell that? No, no, it's K E N E L M, Ken Allen Digby, D I G B Y. See, one, one of the things about writers of the, about this stuff in the 19th century was that they tried to have the most un American names possible. <laughs> Ken Allen Digby was originally called Bob Smith, and he, he changed the name. So I, no, seriously, uh, he actually came from a very old family that fought in the Civil War, all that kind of stuff. But he wrote a book called The Broadstone of Honor, which was, uh, actually it's a big four-volume thing. You can see it all online, you can read it. Uh, which for the early 19th century English audience tried to interpret chivalry and thereby to explain the Catholic faith. And many a 19th century English convert got to start reading The Broadstone of Honor. So, here are a couple of quotes from him. He says, Chivalry is only a name for that general spirit or state of mind which disposes men to heroic and generous actions and keeps them conversant with all that is beautiful and sublime in the intellectual and moral world. Think about that. What does that mean? Hmm. What does it mean? It, what does it mean? <laughs> It means that chivalry is the quintessence of all that's good and true and noble. That's what it means. And then he says, as in the warfare of the Middle Ages, when each man was regarded as a power, i.e. a fighter, so in the spiritual combats of all times, chivalry requires every man to believe that he is personally called upon to pronounce between error and truth, injustice and justice, vice and virtue. The fights of chivalry are not simply disputes between landowners or, you know, you and your bank, but about real important, essential things. Then he says, in hostility to the world's claims, our Savior Jesus Christ is become the chief and eternal king of all the really free, generous, and heroic spirits that exist upon the earth, that it is to him alone they come, offering the homage of undivided love, and that, renouncing allegiance to the world, scorning its pretensions, and regarding with the utmost degree of contempt and detestation its haughty standard of false honor and false liberty and false virtue, it is to his church they repair, from every region and language and people, to confirm their union, to proclaim their fidelity, to take up the arms with which they are to fight against the ruler of this world, to secure their deliverance from the hand of their enemies, and to receive power from their adorable world, uh, sorry, from their adorable Lord, who is enthroned in the center of their hearts, to serve him without fear all their days in holiness and justice. 
that gentleman, that show, always, always, always it has as its center Christ our King. And then the um, other great commentator of that era on chivalry was a fellow called Leon Gautier. Again, spell. I didn't spell it, not no. It's L E O N, that spells Leon. And Gautier, or Gautier, is G A U T I E R. And his great book on chivalry was called, you have a hard time remembering this one, Chivalry. <laughs> spell that. No. Uh, S S H E B. Anyway, so his comment too. Now, mind you, Gautier was French. Very different from Digby, who was English. We can't all be French. It's an affliction many people say. And we do try to be kind to them. But uh, he says this Chivalry may be considered as an eighth sacrament. And this is perhaps the name that suits it best, which describes it most accurately. It is the sacrament, it is the baptism of the warrior. But we must also regard it as a corporation, like a college, of which every member is a responsible individual. It is true that this last idea is not a very ancient date, and it has taken a long time to shape itself, and has only in a comparatively late period reached its novel development. But at any rate, amongst the formulas which were customary in the reception of a knight, there was one which from this point of view is very significant. I receive thee willingly into our college. You have to think of the whole body of knights, including those inside and out of orders, as being in some sense, even though they had to fight each other, part of a grand corporation, a grand guild as it were. A curious confraternity too, he goes on to say this, a curious confraternity too, one of which all the members were every day exposed to battle, to fight with and to massacre each other, as a, massacre, as a matter of course. Yet it was necessary, in order to kill each other in this fashion, that these adversaries should entertain a real esteem, one for the other, and consider themselves as equals. The very poorest, the most humble of the knights, was the equal of a knightly king, of an emperor. And you know, many of the things that came out of the battlefields of those days we have today. For instance, the idea of the Red Cross, serving everybody on the battlefield equally. That came from Shoah. That, that, didn't, uh, that didn't come up from nowhere. And it's interesting that the symbol of the Red Cross is the symbol of the Knights Templar reversed. And that was done on purpose, just so you know. Uh, one more commentator, and then we'll get to the meat of the matter, as it were, is an individual whom some of you will probably know more likely than the other two, and that is Don Prosper Gironche. Or as some call him, Don Prosper Garanger. <laughs> Not in my hurry, I hope. Who wrote a wonderful book called The Liturgical Year, in many, many volumes. He describes how the Pope at Christmas, up until the mid 19th century, although it was still going out when he wrote, <coughs> performed a very interesting, interesting ceremony. And I'll let Garanger describe it for you. He says, speaking of Christ, the divine infant, who is, remember he's speaking of Christmas, the divine infant who is to be born amongst us is the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, who is governed to us upon his shoulders, as we shall sing tomorrow with the church. We have already seen how the God of hosts has honored this power of Emmanuel by leading powerful nations to acknowledge him who lay in the crib of Bethlehem as the Lord to whom they owe their adoring fealty. The same recognition of that babe as the mighty God is made by the ceremony to which we are you. The sovereign pontiff, the vicar of our Emmanuel, blesses in his name the sword and helmet, which ought to be sent to some Catholic warrior who has deserved well of the Christian world. In a letter addressed to Queen Mary of England and to Philip, her husband, Elizabeth's older sister, Cardinal Pole gives an explanation of this solemn rite. The sword is sent to some prince whom the vicar of Christ wishes to honor in the name of Jesus, who is king. For the angel said to Mary, the Lord will give him to him the throne of David his father. It is from him alone that the power of the say of the sword comes. For God said to Cyrus, I have girded thee with the sword. And the psalmist speaks to the Christ of God, Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O thou most. And because the sword should not be drawn, save in the, course of, in the cause of justice, it is for that reason that a sword is blessed on this night, in the midst of which rises, born unto us, the divine Son of Justice. 
On the helmet, which is both the ornament and protection of the head, there is worked in pearls the dove, which is the emblem of the Holy Ghost. And this to teach him who wears it that it is not from passion or ambition that he must use his sword, but solely under the guidance of the Divine Spirit and from a motive of spreading the kingdom of Christ. How beautiful is this union of energy and meekness under the one symbol and ceremony. The power of blending and harmonizing the very beauty of distinctive classes of truth is not to be found save in that Christian Rome, which is our mother, and where God has established the center of light and love. The ceremony we have been describing is still observed, if only. Uh, what a grandness it would be having the names of all those glorious Christian warriors who were thus created knights of the church at the Salama, when we celebrate the birth of him who came to vanquish our enemy. We are going to adore this babe in his crib. Let us think of our mother's teaching and pay homage to him as our prince and king and beseech him to humble the enemies of his church and vanquish those who are leagued against both our perfection and our salvation. Anybody here ever hear that ceremony before? Yeah, you don't count. You, no fair, you knew. <clears throat> anyway, well, there's something funny about that, by the by. Anyone here ever go to Edinburgh Castle and see the Scottish Crown Jewels? Okay, well, you'll see something funny if you ever go, and that is the sword of state. I talked about the crown and the orb and all that. Well, most of them also have a sword of state, which shows the king's duty and privilege to defend his people. The Scottish sword of state has the tiara and keys on the scabbard and on the sword itself because it was the sword sent by the Pope of the time, King James IV, and it was incorporated into the Scottish crown jewels. It so happened that I was there, uh, you know, you go through this long tray like thing to look at them, and there's a couple were ahead of us, the you know, old Scots Presbyterians, you know, members of the cat. And the man says, what's out there then for? Pointing at the tiara and keys. I believe I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, oh, what is it then? Well, you see, before John Knox sold your country to England, it was a Catholic country, and this was a gift of the Pope here at Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't disagree, but he wasn't. Yeah. The other interesting thing is that if you go to Berlin, the Schlottenburg Palace, and you see the Prussian crown jewels, same, same. Their sort of state was a similar gift to the then elector of Brandenburg before the Reformation by the Pope. So now you know. Anyway, and speaking of swords, that brings us to the ceremony at night. I won't give a great deal of detail on this, except where it's going to illustrate our major point, which we're finally almost arrived at. It is important to bear in mind that one didn't suddenly become a knight. It, it took time. It took training, indeed, most of a lifetime. One of the other things that happened as knighthood progressed was that not only did it become more restricted who could give it out, but also who could get it. Whereas before, it really, if you did well in battle, your chief of knighthood. Uh, later on, it became more and more the privilege of landholding families, of noble families. And there were reasons for this, one of them being that every knight was expected to be able to provide not only his own service, but men at arms and sometimes other things to his lord. And obviously you can't do that if you're a poor man. Now, people often object to the Knights of Malta today and the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. They say, well, you know, they're rich men's clubs. Well, yeah, but see, money is the weapon we have today. And in those particular orders, what they have to do requires a lot of dough. Why can't I join the Knights of Malta? Because I couldn't afford 10000 a year. But that 10000 a year is far better employed by them than it would be by the March of Dimes. Something to think about. So, um, yeah, the summer pro-boards. Uh, well, or, or uh, what's that other one? United Way. Some of our biggest pro boards in this state were, were Knights of Malta. I, I kind of tangled with the general. Let's, let's do some general. questions and answers. Okay. Questions and answers. Write it down. I'll uh, believe you. Make your, your questions as challenging as you like. But bear in mind the answers may be the same. So, um, <laughs> But anyway, I may ask your, you know, your bank account number and your, your PIN number. <laughs> anyway, uh, I hope you will say drop dead. Uh, the thing is that 
what the way it ended up working out when neither was in flower was that uh, you remember a noble family whose members generally come next. Because remember in those days too, fighting was pretty much the bailiwick of the nobility. The peasants for the most part didn't fight, unless Muslims or pirates or something were attacked. You know what they did? They farmed. The guildsmen in the cities, they made stuff. The nobility were the ones who fought, which is why they were noble. And the king was the chief of the country's chivalry because he led the armies. As the late Archduke von Haro, uh, Otto von Habsburg said, uh, monarchy began to die when kings ceased to lead their troops into battle. There's a certain truth to that. Now, as President Obama said when he was leading the uh, troops in Afghanistan, anyway! <laughs> you know, I, I said we were going to mention that man again. Here you go, bring him up. Fine, I don't care. Anyway, what would happen is you would send your younger son to be raised at another castle, another noble, to be taught the way this is polite society. Etiquette, in other words. And the etiquette, you know, that we enjoyed up until the 1960s, a la Emily Post and Amy Vanderbilt, was a last breeze of chivalry. Just like the conventions of hunting war, for that matter, the ballet and the opera. So you, you have no idea, gentlemen, to make a study of it, how much of what we've enjoyed has come to us from chivalry. You really don't. But I digress. So, from about age 12 to, say, 16 or 17, about five years maybe, the kid would be taught how to behave in public. He would be uh, do gymnastics, he'd be taught horseback riding, he'd start learning a bit of sword play, all that sort of thing. His tree would then become a squire. And he would, his training would intensify. And finally, 22, 23, 24, depending on when it was ready, he would be knighted by the king of the bishop. And he might at that point go into an order if he felt like it was an order to say or do something else. Uh, one of the interesting things was that his knighthood, because of the changes in uh, warfare, gunpowder and cannery and all that, knighthood eventually became purely a way of the king to reward uh, I mean, outside of the orders, Malta, there's not Matt's kept doing other things, but knighthood, in a civil sense, became more of a declaration. And because, after a while, the kings began to charge for knighting, a lot of the families who would have been knighted, they, they stopped doing it. They stopped, in other words, at squire. Have you ever heard the phrase, esquire or squire? Of a wealthy person? Ah, it's all squire tips. It mean, probably comes of a family that 200, 300 years ago would have produced knights. However, as you know, in, in the States, we don't have that. So whereas in England, property-owning families were all called squires after a while. In our country, of course, we're free of that. So it was uh, used primarily for professional men. And they're eventually only lawyers. And that's why you write your lawyer as Henry Smith, a squire. That's what it comes from. Anyway, so now you're ready to be knighted. The ceremonies were very wildly from place to place, but they had several things in common. The night before you're knighted, vigil with your arms in the church all night long. Not playing canasta, not playing with your iPod, praying, meditating, maybe sleeping, but all night. And then early on, in many of the rites, you'd be given a bath to signify a uh, renewal of your baptism and of your cleansing from what had gone before. Then came the ceremony itself. Now, the ceremony of knighting, a version of it, stayed in the Roman Pontificale until 1962. It's important to know this because every ritual of the church conveys certain blessings. They are important. They are worth knowing. They are worth dealing with. You don't say a particular blessing, you don't get the blessing. You have the blessing said, you get the blessing. If you get the chance, you can get the Pontificale online, and you can use Google to translate it into Googleese, if not English, or understand what's going on. The prayers of the Order of Knighting in the Pontificale will tell you an awful lot about what the Church has taught about war and peace, and about what it is to be a knight. i give you only one, and this is for the imposition of the sword. Receive this sword in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 
Use it in defense of thyself and the Holy Church of God for the confusion of the enemies of the cross of Christ and of the Christian faith, and never unjustly to the injury of any man, so far as human frailty will and there. That was the blessing given with your sword. How different from the way we look at these things today. Uh, frailty except collateral damage. Too bad. Now this isn't to say that everybody lived up to it. They lived up to it or lived down to it the way, oh, I don't know, you and I do my baptismal vows. <laughs> no, my, my what? Yes, we got baptismal vows. They were held to be just as sacred and they were perhaps honored as much in the breaches of the observance, like all of us. But the point is, that's what they were aiming at. So, the, uh, we then move on <coughs> to the Ten Commandments of Shavuot. Why are these important? Because, you know, they were valid then, and they're valid now. If you would lead a chivalrous life, this is a bloody good code. And I say bloody on purpose, because it's a contraction of my own lady. And as we'll see in a moment, that played a big part in Shavuot spirituality. One, thou shalt believe all that the church teaches and shalt observe all its directions. Wow. <laughs> that is the first commandment expected out of the knights. We don't expect that out of ourselves, you know how I know? The way we keep the rogation days. <laughs> The everydays, the, the uh, vigils and feasts. I know I always eat a lot on all those days. But that's a small thing. There's a lot of other stuff that we don't think about. Or we let ourselves slide on. You see, the knight expected more of himself than of those under him. If you want to be tough on others, start with you first, and then we'll see. When I'm observing all the fasts of the church, properly, and yet not falling into pride. Oh, look at me. Did I mention sure I keep the end of it? <laughs> you see, because if, if it feeds your pride, that's no good either. The funny thing about the Catholic life is that it's always between Scylla and Charybdis, you know. You can't presume, you can't despair. You can't, uh, you, know, you, you, you can't uh, do too much of this or too much of that. But it is that golden mean that we try to keep our eyes on. Number two, thou shalt defend the church. Now what does that mean? What does defending the church mean? It can mean a lot of things. How often when we're in social gatherings or at work do we hear this or that uh, dogma of the church or this or that church from disparage? You know, I don't want the Pope in my bedroom. How often do I hear that when I had an office job? Whenever I hear it, I couldn't help myself. And it wasn't because I was virtuous, it's because I'm not a very nice person. But <laughs> what immediately popped out of my mouth was, if you've got the Pope in your bedroom, you've got problems, and I can't help you with that. <laughs> and then, of course, they turn right red and want to talk about something else. But um, depending on your own ability, because you know some of us are, are gifted with quick comebacks, Others are better at putting tax in people's seats. <laughs> uh, but, well, you know, we all, we're all called to different skills, you know. You, you can only work with what you've got. You know, if, you, if you've got a peg leg, hit them over the head of it. But, uh, no, but seriously, always depending on who you are, where you are, what you're doing, and bearing in mind that God has put each of us in the position we're in. It didn't happen by accident, you know. God wasn't vacationing in Cuba when you were born. Huh. He, he knew... He knew you were going to be there, and he did it on purpose. So we have to bear in mind, as the knights did, that when the church was attacked in front of us, we were put there for that purpose. You see, it didn't happen by accident. And very often it's a test. You know, what are we made of? I'll tell you something else. Most often we do fail it. But the trick is not whether we fail it. The trick is pulling ourselves together like the knights of old and charging once more into the fray. I hate to quote uh, Henry V again, but once more into the breach, dear gentlemen. 
Number three, and this one is really hard. Thou shalt defend all weaknesses and constitute thyself the defender of them. All weaknesses. What does that mean? Well, it starts in school. Now, you homeschoolers wouldn't have seen bullies. You probably don't know what the word means. But the chivalrous kid tries to defend the picked upon child. And believe me, that ain't fun. And if you don't fall into the habit of the school, you're going to try to cultivate it later. And yet, you've also got to exercise prudence. Uh, you know, if your co-worker really is a drunk, <laughs> well, maybe you, better, maybe you better let nature take its course. But, uh, you know, no, I don't mean you want his job and keep taking him out of the bar every night. That's not my point. No. But, nevertheless, when you see people unfairly put upon, or talked about, how often do you find yourself in a situation where someone's getting gossiped about? And you know that's not true. But do I stand up for it? You see, chivalry is not simply a question of fighting the enemies of our day. It's an everyday thing. And it's cultivation, every day in small things, will help equip us internally to fight the major battles if as and when they come our way. Four, and this is really tough, thou shalt love the country in which thou wast born. Now, what does that mean? You're a grand old flag, you're a high flag. No, not necessarily. Anybody hear the phrase, I wish my country were always right, but my country right or wrong? Yeah. That's like Kurtz, England expects every man. How does the believing Catholic, the would-be chivalrous Catholic, how does he love his country? Well, first by accepting for what it is, by not projecting. And our country is not a Catholic country. Not even Christian. Not now. It's sort of post-Protestant. But we have to accept that first. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you had a relative you loved who was a Mormon or a Presbyterian or a three-seat in three the spirit predestinarian Baptist, if you can pronounce it, you're doing better than she is probably, um, what would you try to do? You would try to work the best you could for a conversion. That is the biggest way you can show a lot. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily smack them on the head with the catechism. It might. You see, loving her means knowing her well enough to try to figure out what will appeal to her to get her into the church. The only way a Catholic can be truly patriotic is to strive as hard as he can for the conversion of his country. And if it seems like an impossible task, it seemed that way to a band of 12 who left Palestine several centuries ago. And yet we're still living off the benefits of what they sowed. Now then, five, this is even tougher. Thou shalt not recoil from thine enemy. Yeah, but I'm hurt. You know what he said about me? He said I was a fanatic. <laughs> and we did. And it was, I was at a cocktail party, and then I came in and he says, oh, look, it's the fanatic. So I, I dropped a devil egg on his head. Well, maybe that's not the best way to do this. But it does mean you have got to try to excise from your soul every element of cowardice. And what is the root of cowardice? Human respect in a non-combat situation. In combat is actually, in physical combat is a different story. But we are sort of trying to interpret this for what most of us like to encounter. The root of what? Human respect is the root of cowardice. Cowardice? Yes. What will they think of me? If I say this, if I disagree, if I say I think abortion is wrong, what will they think of me? I know. That's what I'm saying, you said. That cowardice has its root in human respect. Because you know what you're actually saying? You're not, you're not examining it. What you're saying is, they are more important to me, their opinion of me is more important to me than God's. <laughs> That's called human respect. 
And St. Teresa of Avila said, you cannot begin to serve God until you lose your reputation. And then she proved it. But, uh, the, the, if the fifth was bad, the sixth is worse. Thou shalt make war against the infidel without cessation and without mercy. Yikes. What could that mean in our context? Well, it means we're coming from a place of great transparency, and we need to expand the conversation. Uh, no, and I, those of you, those of you who have to listen to this guff a lot, will recognize the terms. If you don't, thank God. What it means for us in the here and now, I do believe, is that we can never stop thinking of it as a spiritual combat. We can never simply say, well, I'm going to put it aside. You know, I, I'm going to be away for a week. And yeah, I know it's kind of a, it's a Masonic summer camp, but that's fine. You know, they're nice people. I mean, no, I, I told myself this when I was up in the Bohemian Grove. I said, <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, maybe I didn't go to the Bohemian Grove. Never mind. But no, seriously, although well, you might go to the Bohemian Grove, you never know. The thing is, if you do find yourself at the Bohemian Grove or anywhere else, you cannot forget that you are a soldier of Christ. And you have to constantly think, all right, what can I do in this context, this setting, with these people, to get the point across? Sometimes it'll lead and say, no, oh, you're all going to hell, stupid jerks. Um, I wouldn't put in stupid jerks, because believe me, people never respond well to that. I've used it a lot, and it never worked for me. The second, however, more, more often, to be honest with you, it requires thinking about them, who they are, what their story is, why they respond. Here's the thing funny, speaking of Masons for a moment. Anybody here ever go to the big Masonic Museum in Washington, D.C., Alexandria? If you ever get the chance, go. It's open to the public, it's lots of fun. Uh, it'll fun for all ages. I've gone there with priests. It's wonderful to see the looks on their faces as the Catholic folk come in. Is that the one on the way to Mount Vernon? Uh, it's all the way to Mount Vernon. Very good. Uh, it's in Alexandria. It. Oh, go in. Go in. The class. different floors are devoted. Listen, it's worth seeing. You want to know what your country's about, don't you? Yeah, but I was in a bus. Oh, well, no. Oh, I, 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 thought you put, I thought you said it was, nah, it's a bust. Uh, well, okay. No. <laughs> but seriously, every floor of that museum, it's also a functioning Masonic temple, is devoted to a different rite or a different fraternity within Masonry, which is... And Washington never went into it. Well, no, it wasn't around then. But they, what they have done is completely reproduced which, by the way, was not at all like that of the mystic that you can see that Ty, uh, Ty Isaacs belonged to. Anyway, uh, other story. Seriously, though, one of the sections has to do with what are called the Knights Templar. Now, the Knights Templar are not the real Knights Templar of days gone by, but they are an organization of Freemasons who like the trappings and all that in the Middle Ages. We go into this, into this room, this Templar chapel, as they call it, you can say mass there. It's got the altar, it's all set up. There is a yearning for this sort of thing. So you know, when you find yourself among Freemasons, ask them what they know about their own temples, and then kind of nudge, presuming you know something about it, nudge it a little bit more into reality. You know, just to make things even worse, they have a degree of the temples that's called Knights of Malta. And the fun part about that is that I've had some trads who are, shall we say, quicker at the mouth than the <coughs> brain. <laughs> How can everything do with the Knights of Malta? They're Masonic! <laughs> no, no. See, they, they made up this degree to imitate the Knight. It's just like if you ever go to see any of the old missions, you'll notice that in some of them, like San Miguel, and in the uh, um, Chasuble, several of the uh, Sarah's Chasubles, you see the Eye of the Triangle, which proves that California was a Masonic plot from the beginning. <laughs> uh, no. No, what it is is that they hijacked a perfectly decent Trinitarian symbol, because that's what it originally symbolized. But bear this in mind, we're going to come up with this again in just a minute. Symbols often change their meanings. And if you really want to sound dumb, conflate yeah. them together. That's a, always a good way to sound like you don't know what you're talking about. And I, I know from experience. So. Anyway, uh, number seven. Thou shalt perform scrupulously thy feudal duties if they be not contrary to the laws of God. How many here have a feudal lord? Well, that's nice. Oh, I, I 
The older brother, younger brother deal? Yeah, I get that from Andre. It's all right, fine. But most of us don't have that. So what could this possibly mean for us? Well, we do have other duties. Duties that we often don't like. In fact, I hate to put this into apparition speech. But do you remember in Fatima something about the duties of our state in life? If you're a husband, let's be a good husband. If you're a father, be a good father. If you're an employer, be a good employer. If you're an employee, be a good employee. And obey those laws that are not in conflict with morality. And that sounds like it's an obvious thing, except it isn't. I'll give you a wonderful example. How many here have access to handicap stickers? I do. So I drive a whole man around. Have you any idea the temptation to use that bloody thing when the old gentleman is not in the car and there's no place to park? But it would be wrong. It would not be chivalrous. Why? Because there might be a real handicapped person who needs it. And I have it on the receiving end. You know, when you're driving around with the handicapped individual, all the handicapped spots are taken, and you see some guy jumping out of it. Yeah, I'm feeling great. You know, and no place to unload the wheelchair. Yeah, but you don't, you don't know, the, real, you don't know the, uh, the realities. They might have x-rays that you've never seen. I know. Don't read too much into it. So, stay with the tour, as we say. The thing is, what appear like small infractions of the law are not. Not if you wish to be chivalrous. I'm going to say something that'll sound funny. It can be any kind of thing, any kind of thing at all. Short changing a tip. Why? Because the chivalrous individual, as we'll see a little bit later, gives largesse to everyone. What you can afford to give, you should give freely. And when someone has done you a service, as a, as a waiter or waitress, tip them one to the best of your ability. It's different, of course, that they shove the coffee in your face and laugh, and then you don't. But this is what I'm saying. We tend to cut corners in all sorts of areas in our lives. We shouldn't. And part of the futile dues is not cutting those corners. Now, if that was bad, eight is worse. Thou shalt never lie and shalt remain faithful to thy pledged word. <coughs> wow. That's tough. But as a good start, you know one good way to keep a promise? Don't make them if you can avoid it. <laughs> but if you've given your word, your word should be your bond. That's the notion of honor. And this is something you know we've gotten away from in our society. These may seem like very basic, small things, but I go back to the original theme. Do not expect to triumph from the great combats against the world, the flesh, and the devil if you're incapable of winning the small ones. And of course, we all fail to do so from time to time, but you pick yourself up and go right back. Nine, oh heavens, I touched on this before. Thou shalt be generous and give largesse to everyone. Wow, that was another reason why they tend to like no women's nights, because they have the dough to give. But that largesse is not necessarily financial if you're not well to do. And if you are well to do, think of how many times you can make things easier for this one or that. Just a few bucks. And that, of course, is something our friends in the Order of Malta, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, put great stress on. Uh, it is an important thing. You know, when I was, I guess, about 12 years old, my dad and I walked down the street. I'm not saying you should necessarily do this because there are all kinds of versions with different ways of handling this particular problem, but it did teach me an important concept. Going down the street, and there's this drop, that was the practice of a bomb, and Eric, you know, one of those people. And he comes up, and he says to my dad, can you give me a quarter? And my dad gave him a buck. And after the guy was out of earshot, I said, Dad, why did you give that man a buck? He's just going to he's gonna drink it up. And my father said, Okay, so there's three things you got to understand. The first is, in the gospel it says, almsgiving giving covers a multitude of sins. And unlike his also perfect younger son, your own father has an awful lot of sins to be covered. 
Secondly, I'm not the kind of hypocrite that would deny a man something I like myself. <laughs> and thirdly, if you live the way that guy did, you need a drink. <laughs> so, with that spirit of generosity, you'll notice one thing that we tend to somehow acquire in this country, and it's a very puritanical and very Calvinist thing, is that there's something virtuous about being stingy. Now that doesn't mean you have to blow all your dough. It's not what I mean. But we tend to take an odd delight in saving that odd nickel. And if you, if you need to, that's not what I'm talking about. I think most of us know what I mean. Uh, you know, well, I, I saved 25 cents on that. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Glad you saved the money. That is alien to the spirit of chivalry. The spirit of chivalry is generosity. Because, again, it is a reflection of our Lord himself. How many here merit the graces God has given them? Show of hands. Oh, gee. Oh, gee, no one's had one. I'm not even mine. Well, if we say that we want to emulate our Lord. One thing we really have to look at is his generosity for us. Unfortunately, for your betters, of whom God, of course, is the first, the only way you can really repay them, in a material sense, is by, is by passing on their graciousness to you, to those below you. And the same is true in terms of age. I mean, when I finally realized uh, my father was fairly elderly, what he had done for me, I said, Dad, I can never repay you. He said, no, you can't. No way. Any more than I can repay my folks. But what you can do is look after the people who come after me, as I've tried to do. That you can do, and that will repay me. Presuming I'm not in hell in a position to enjoy it. So that is something to bear in mind. Generosity is a real real virtue. I don't mean prodigality, which is something different. But, as the priest will tell you, although prodigality can be sinful, its opposite is more so. I think that's a fair thing to say. Now, oh, oh, by the way, that can also be the collection plate. In case anyone knows, the quarter of the collection plate went out in the 1950s. <laughs> Just so you know. Unless there are four quarters, then never mind. I don't know. Give advice like that for the priest. Silver, so, silver quarters. So silver quarters. <laughs> <laughs> all silver coins. Gold pieces. You know, yeah. uh, lastly, and this is sort of a summation of all that's come before, thou shalt be everywhere and always the champion of the right and the good against injustice and evil. You see how that's everything brought down to one. But bear in mind, that starts at the low level. It starts with the evil you see around you. It starts with the difficulties you see. Because bear in mind, it can be many, many things. Helping somebody out has got a problem. It can be just as important in the greater scheme of things as anything else you might be doing that day. My old father, who as you guessed was a big influence on me, uh, had a very, very funny funny thing he used to say. He said, son, you can be assured that if you make it to heaven, you will find that things were not at all the way you thought they were. So what do you mean? He says, well, imagine that you endowed tons of hospitals and churches and this and that all around the world. And then you die. And you go up to the gates and St. Peter says, well, it's good to see you. You're welcome to heaven. He says, great. So tell me, St. Peter, tell me. What was it that you really liked? Was it all hospitals? They were nice. Well, the church? They were good. We appreciated it. Well, well come on. What was my biggest, my biggest accomplishment? I'll tell you. Do you remember when you were 14 years old and you were standing on the corner of Wilcox and Hollywood and that station wagon pulled up and they asked you where Coenga was and you told them? They got there in time. And that was the greatest thing you ever did. <laughs> because we can't See the totality. All we see is the little bit we're given to see, so we have to do the best we can with every moment. And that's what chivalry is about. Now, 
I'm going to, I'm coming perilously close to the end, which I'm sure you're all grateful for. <laughs> um, but I do want to say one thing about specific children spirituality. And what I thought was wonderful about the, I was doing my first time in the church today, that the church you have symbolizes so much of chivalric spirituality. Why do I say that? Well, you've got Christ the King, the Sacred Heart, of which we're in a moment. You've got Our Lady as Queen. You have the angels, who are such a big part of the devotion of uh, the spirit of uh, the knights. The question that one might have is what what would qualify as specifically chivalric spirituality today? Bearing in mind, bearing in mind that chivalry today is really, really the spiritual path of a militant lay Catholic man. That is what chivalry is. So, of all the many, many devotional aids, what do we have particularly to look at? Well, first and foremost, as with the medieval knights, is the Mass. They never did anything without going to the Mass. Whenever you read King Arthur and all that, what's the first thing they do? You go to Mass. Very, very important. Now, the second great note of their spirituality was to the five wounds of Christ. Now this, have you seen the Jerusalem cross, which is the, the big cross like this, and little crosses like that? All right, that Jerusalem cross, which is the symbol of God for Abouillon and all the crusaders of, of that time, that represents the five wounds. And the, the big cross in the center represents the wound in the side. And the wound at the side cut into what? The heart. The heart. Contrary to what you may have heard, although she popularized it and received, shall we say, the finishing touches on the devotion from our Lord, the devotion of the Sacred Heart did not begin with St. Margaret Mary Allen Croak. It goes back a long way into its roots, back to the very beginning of the church. The five wounds were very, very important to the Knights of Old. And when Henry VIII took England away from the faith, the Catholics of the north of England rose up, and what did they carry in the pilgrimage of faith? The banner of the five wounds. Moreover, has anyone here ever heard of a story called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight? Show of hands. All right, now you'll notice that Sir Gawain goes off to do battle with a pentagram on his shield. Well, a lot of our Wiccan friends have said, you see, that shows that Sir Gawain was actually a symbol of a fertility god. <laughs> no. It's also led a lot of other Catholics to say, well, the pentagram was satanic. So, oh, Sir Gawain must have been a saint next. No. The Satanists invert the pentagram the way they invert the cross. And inverting the cross doesn't make the cross a satanic symbol. It means you're trying to dump on it. What the pentagram meant to our medieval ancestors was not Wicca, which is an <coughs> age-old religion that goes all the way back to the 1920s. But, well, we all have to have roots somewhere, but it represents two major things, the five wounds of Christ and the five joys of Our Lady, the Annunciation, the Nativity, the Resurrection, Ascension, and Assumption. It also represents the five virtues of, uh, of chivalry, which are free giving, friendliness, there is something we good Catholics try not to think about, chastity, chivalry, and piety. Now then, some, all of you folks here tonight saw another, another element of nightly piety. You were given a vision of the Holy Grail. It's true. When Father elevated the chalice. You betcha. You see, on the one hand, is a material item, the Holy Grail, that is to say, the cup, that our Lord first transubstantiated his blood in, uh, is in all likelihood in Valencia, Spain, in the cathedral. Area. But it is interesting that the Grail stories, although there have been a few, they only really started to get big in the 1100s and the 1200s. 
Now, there have been a lot of explanations for it, and again, our New Age friends will say that's when the ships began coming from Alpha Centauri, or whatever it is. But the real reason, <laughs> the real reason is that it was about that time, culminating in 1215, the definition of the Council of Lyon, that the Church began to say that the best way to describe what happens to the uh, elements at Mass is transubstantiation. And the Grail stories are very much a reflection of that. That's why in tale after tale, when someone sees the Grail, he sees Christ himself in the cup. Or Christ himself in a host suspended over the cup. That's a confession of faith in transubstantiation. And it also leads into the devotion of the precious blood. So I would say also, when you think of the precious blood, when you think of shrines like Bruges and so on, very, very chivalric. The blood that he shed for us, the blood that we receive at Mass, the blood whose effects purify us in confession, the blood that is the symbol of sacrifice. Because I haven't spelled it out clearly yet, but have you noticed that one of the themes going through all of this is sacrifice on the part of the night? Putting oneself out? Well, that is an attempt to palely reflect his sacrifice for us. And what is the biggest, most obvious symbol of that? The precious blood. So, that too should be a hallmark of our spirituality. The Sacred Heart, we've already touched on, but I want to amplify it a little bit. Because, starting with the French Revolution in the Vendée, and a little a few years afterwards in the Tyrol, the uh, Catholic opposition there against Napoleon, and going on through the Carlos in Spain and various other folk around the world, the, and certainly the papal swabs in Italy, uh, the Sacred Heart became in the 19th century very much a symbol of Catholic militancy. Now, in the years prior, just prior to Vatican II, it got kind of a little vitiated because you would see all these very well, not really overly masculine pictures of the Sacred Heart. And people would make fun of things like the Auto League of the Sacred Heart, which I'm a proud member, I'll just say that. Uh, and what they missed is the point. The Sacred Heart, on the one hand, is the symbol of Christ's love for us as human lovers. But that love is expressed through this enormous sacrifice that he made for us that we can never repay. And so those Catholic militants who knew that they were likely going to be defeated, but would do or die for the faith anyway, naturally adopted the Sacred Heart as their back. It also helped that our, that our Lord told St. Mark and Mary Alacoque to tell Louis XIV to put the banner of the Sacred Heart on the French flag, and that if he did, he'd win. He did, he did. So that is another thing to keep in mind. All of this, of course, culminates in devotion to Christ the King. And that is, of course, bound up. What the devil is that? Oh, it's a lid or something. Fly away home. The house is on fire. You're so alone. Anyway, uh, married, however, to our love of Christ the King must be that of Mary, our Queen. Even our phrase, Our Lady, is extremely chivalrous. It's where it comes from. The idea of jousting for our, for our lady. It's, it, it's knighthood and flower all over. The queenship of Mary is something we need to study and cultivate in our own lives. Having said all of that, I will uh, redo my 40 page over the spring. No, <laughs> I will not do that. Uh, you're saved. Uh, I will give you two more quotes, and then I'll let you can ask questions if you have any. Although, if I've explained everything, that's great. Um, there was a knight called Eustache Deschamps, who lived in the 1300s, and he was French, oddly enough. Uh, hence the name that you can't pronounce. Um, Spell it. Uh, e U S T A C H E D E S C H E. I was just joking, Charles. I could spell it in Yiddish. I don't know. Anyway, he wrote this poem called The Knightly Code. And it really encapsulates very, very well everything I think we can discuss. You who seek the knightly order, 
must begin your life in you. Watch and pray you most devoutly. Pride and wicked sin is true. Protect the church, the child, the widow. Strongly guard the people too. Valor, loyalty, and virtue from a worthy knight of you. An humble art, an active body, chivalry you demands. Fight you well and often journey o'er the seas to other lands. Joust you for the love of lady on the tilt yard's tawny sands. Tenderly protect your honor with your soul and with your hands. Love the Lord who calls you vassal, guard his fields from enemy, liberality and justice church. Seek the company of other knights, that from their wisdom yours may grow to like degree. Thus a knight like Alexander, may you hope in time to be. And lastly, the last word I will give to Leon Gautier, who says, when he's speaking of why he wrote the book, he says, but we conceived another idea which may appear more daring still. This was to enlarge the mind, to check the mercantile spirit which abases, and the egotism which is killing it, to convey to it some of the enthusiasm for the beautiful which is menaced, and for the truth which seems to us to be dying out. There is more than one kind of chivalry, and lance thrusts are not everything. In default of the sword, we have the pen, Failing the pen, speech, and in default of speech, honor in our lives. Thank you. until about 9 o'clock. I believe Monsignor had some cigars that will be distributed afterwards. St. Michael's cigars. Oh, no. Let's do it now. Let's okay. pass those things out. Let's no. light those puppies up. No, he had brandy. And he has brandy too, stuck in uh, under his cassock. <laughs> I dare you to try to find him under his cassock. All right, first question for Charles. Charles, on one of my pieces, I keep hearing this term Christian instead of Catholic. And I'm wondering why, in, in the sword pledge, way back then, he was Christian instead of Catholic. Why? And when? And well, when? way back then, when you, you read the sword, the pledge, the sword they made over the sword. Oh yeah. Because they used Christian instead of Catholic. Christian meant. The, there was no in those days there were no Protestants. Oh. So, I mean, you heard the thing. Oh, I'm not Catholic. I'm Christian. There were no. There was no one to say that Christian meant Catholic. It was the same thing. Because I just corrected a priest because he's using that and I said, Father, why don't you use Catholic? That is a very today. good friend of mine. That's true enough today. Nobody here. That's, that, that's true enough today. In those days, there were no not Catholics to speak of. So, if, uh, if you say Christian, you're not Catholic. Full stop. That is one of my pet peeves. Say, go ahead. Uh, Cervantes and Don Quixote, you didn't mention anything of that. I heard that that was destructive. Well, it was, uh, the question is, what about Cervantes and Don Quixote, and was that start of destructive chivalry? Well, to a great degree it was. What was ironic, of course, was that Cervantes had fought in the Battle of Lepanto, and so he actually was quite a chivalric person himself. But you also got to bear in mind that the ridicule of chivalry is not really so much of chivalry per se, but of the romantic novels of the time that were so excessive. And actually, if you read the book, Don Quixote, although he has his moments, the famous tilting at windmills, which in turn gave birth to my favorite film, The Mighty Giants, that's another story. Um, nevertheless, he ends up actually completing his quest. People never read all of Don Quixote. They only get the small bits, like Dulcinea and the silver chamber pot, the golden chamber pot of Membrino and all that. But they... We forget that it was satire on the literature of the time. It wasn't simply an attack on chivalry, per se. And in the end, Don Quixote turns out to have been a real and true knight. At the end, he ends up, in a sense, fulfilling his quest. Okay, thank you. Sin, uh, Nick? Well, for the 
identify virtues of chivalry again? Um, actually, if you didn't copy them down, then... Where can we look them up? That's what I was going to ask you. I'm sorry, you don't, you don't get... No. The five virtues of chivalry. Eh, you see, I didn't read most of my notes. Aren't you lucky? Uh, they are... Free giving. Friendliness. Chastity. Chivalry. And piety. The ten you mentioned, where do we get those on the computer? Those, those are the Ten Commandments. Those are different. But where can we get them on the computer? What's that? Where can we get them on the computer? Watch we look, look up Ten Commandments of Chivalry, Gautier. Boom. Okay, great. Yeah, Google around. Yes, Francisco. Thank you, Charles. So you mentioned that in 1962, the Pontificale stopped. That was the last edition. No, we, we shouldn't mention that, no. What I'm saying is they never tried to modernize it after that well, no, they, they just took it out. They just took it out. Uh, personally, you know, I've often felt, and as things go on, you know, what's his name? Cardinal George made the comment that he thought that he would die in bed, his successor in prison, and his successor be executed. I kind of think that, again, given the graces that flow from every particular ceremony, every ritual of the church, I think it would be a good idea to think about reviving him for apologists. Catechists and certainly Catholics uh, or uh, military officers. Yeah. Because they all need the graces that that particular right gives. And that virtually almost nobody are getting now. So I think it was for the papal orders? No, that's a, that's a different thing. The papal orders, like Sylvester and Gregory and all that, those are not organic orders, they're decorations. They're, they're, a couple of them have sort of medieval roots. But in the present form, they come to us in the 19th century. So then when was the spiritual abuse? Yeah. Okay, so before it gets too late to have a cigar, um, they are over on that table. There's some Armagnac, there's some Tennessee honey, there's cutters, there's lighters. Just make sure the cutters and lighters make their way back, please. So just go over there and help yourself during the q &A. Uh, On behalf of His Excellency, the Governor of California, I just want to say shame. Shame. Hey! Uh, uh, for all of you who don't know about it, I strongly recommend you look at the Battle of Czestochowa in Poland. There you will find out what 50 monks and a few others and the courts of Blessed Mother and they say St. Paul did to a whole army of thousands of Protestants from Sweden. The Battle of Czestochowa. I just read it for the second time. Every time you read it, you get more. That's one thing I didn't mention, uh, and that is the saints of Chivalry, of whom there are very many. Uh, good thing to bear in mind is that St. Michael, St. James, people like that, from time to time appear about. And I'll give you a hint. Can anybody guess which decade the last known apparition of a saint for a Christian army appeared? It's the, it is the decade you would think least likely. No, not you, Tom. What's that? It was his first world war. No. Nope. Nope. What's that? No. Nope. No. It was the age of disco. It was the 70s, when polyester was king. Only in Lebanon, it was the Civil War. And a group of Maronites were hard pressed by the Muslims. And the martyr of St. George appeared. And they fled. And this apparition is not from Bob's Book of Apparitions, but from the Melchite Diocese of Baalbek. And we know what we say about the diocese and approved apparitions, don't we? We accept them or we don't comment. All right. Any more? Yes, try to do this. Oh, well, well, Charles is going to have a cigar. You can approach him personally, okay? And now, um, he lies. I charge by the person. Okay, one, one more thing, guys. Um, Terry, uh, we have a picture in the back which is a, a, an, an artist here at the church is painting. 
and we are doing a raffle to raise money for the men's group. It's five dollars for the ticket. You can see Terry or you can see Joel. And uh, please consider donating to the men's group. Okay, so we'll have a cigar, we'll have a postprandial, and we'll get to know each other a little bit better. Here.